Your speed stick. There we go. There you Perfect. Go. Okay, everybody. Hi, I'm Matthew from Matrix.org. Thank you for your patience. We'll be messing around with the computers, and um, thank you for hanging on until almost the end of the Web3 Summit to listen to clearly the best track of all, um, the messaging and communications track. Um, so I'm Matthew. I'm the tech co-founder of Matrix.org. Um, who, who knows what Matrix is already? Okay, probably about half the room. So thank you, everybody, who um, already has encountered the magical world of Matrix. Um, I would like to tell you a bit more about it, probably give a quick introduction at the beginning um, for people who don't already know about it, and then hopefully, if we can get the HDMI working, um, show you some fun stuff that we're working on and some stuff from the future, or which will happen in the future, but will happen now, if you see what I mean. Um, so first of all, Matrix itself. We are a big, open, global network for secure, decentralized um, communication. Um, so it, this isn't um, a blockchain-based um, solution, although it is using Merkle proofs um, for its cryptography um, primitives. And um, so we're slightly the odd one out here in that we're not talking about Ethereum. Uh, we're not uh, even talking about the sort of traditional blockchain space. But what we focus on instead is really low latency, fast, real-time communication. So typically, that's interoperable chat. Use cases like Slack or WhatsApp. Um, or Discord or Telegram, or it could be interoperable VoIP, so more like Skype or doing VoIP calls over WhatsApp, etc. And the more future-looking stuff is um, being a communication layer for VR and AR, because right now, if I want to talk to somebody in VR, I'm screwed. They have to be on the same app, probably using the same headset. There is no commonality between any of these virtual worlds today, and we would like Matrix to be it. Ah, even better. Can I switch over? allows me to jump around a little bit more. And then finally, IoT data fabrics, um, because IoT still has a massive problem in terms of the lack of um, standard data there. If you have your connected devices and they want to share the data together, you're a bit screwed. Talking about screwed, should I get rid of that? Uh, one sec. There we go. OK. So. Oh, amazing lag, everything that can go wrong. Our mission is to create really this global encrypted comms network that provides an open platform, much like the web itself, for real-time comms. Practically speaking, it looks something like this. Or more accurately, it doesn't, because Matrix is missing in this diagram. You have your various different bubbles, things like Telegram or Slack. It could be an app system like GitHub. It could be another centralized thing like Gitter or even IRC. And we go and put Matrix in the middle as a network which goes and federates and links all of these together. And the key thing is that you have um, the blue servers here in the middle, which um, store the conversations which are going on. You have these lighter blue things which are bridging them through to other systems like Slack or Telegram. And you also have green dots here which refer to matrix clients, which are natively speaking this protocol. So in the simplest case, you can just ignore the outside and think of Matrix as being a big decentralized encrypted alternative to Slack. Or you can look at the bigger picture and see it as a big global network, a bit like the phone network, honestly, but intended for decentralized encrypted communication. The main, main things which everybody here should understand about Matrix is that we designed it so that no single party can ever own your conversations. The act of talking to somebody on a different server by definition, means that you share your copy of the conversation with them. So in that respect, it's very similar um, to the blockchain as an architecture. You end up with conversations being democratized, equally shared over all participants. It is impossible for Google or Facebook or Slack or whoever it is to capture your communications in a silo. Because the second you talk to somebody on another system, they have completely equal ownership of the conversation. And a bit like um, when Bitcoin first came around, it was a nightmare to explain to people what a blockchain was and how it worked. We still have this problem in Matrix today that people come to us and say, you oh, know, how do I delete this thing from my server? Or how do I, uh, no, what server is my room on or my conversation on? We say, well, it isn't on a server. The whole point is that it's replicated over like thousands of servers, depending on how many different servers are participating in the conversation. So architecturally speaking, um, this is uh, basically what we end up with. You have your network of home servers. You have application servers, which are the um, kind of uh, the bots, the bridges, the um, search engines, all of the added functionality. 
We have identity servers, which are a bit of a sore point. It's um, a centralized bit of the architecture currently. We're waiting to switch them over for anything that can map email addresses and phone numbers through to arbitrary IDs. And there's obviously a lot of that happening in the Ethereum space Zoom today. Um, but we haven't done it yet. It's um, coming up soon. And then obviously you have clients as well. This is kind of the big schematic that tries to explain really what's going on here. Our main deliverable is the spec, which is a very comprehensive document that defines a bunch of HTTP and JSON APIs for sending and receiving messages. And it's designed to be as stupid and as simple as possible. It's a thin client architecture here with the clients on the top and the servers on the bottom. And if I want to send a message to somebody in Matrix, I do an HTTP post. And if I want to receive one, I do an HTTP GET. And that's it. So it's just a very simple HTTP web API um, for sending and receiving real-time um, content. The fun stuff happens on the server side, where we go and replicate this between the different servers. And we have our first generation server here um, in Python called Synapse, uh, which is approaching a 1.0 now. And uh, we've just finished porting the whole thing to Python 3. And we're busy going around squashing the final P1 bugs. Um, but we should hopefully be getting it to a 1.0 in the next month or two. Then we have Dendrite, which is our next generation Golang server, which is um, very, very horizontally scalable. Um, you can keep spinning up little Golang services to scale out your deployment to millions of users. Then you've got lots of bridges and services through to other technologies, um, like the ones I mentioned earlier. And there's also a massive community of people building on top of Matrix, mainly on the client side, um, but also on the server side and the bridges and the bot side. Meanwhile, on the client side, we have a complete web stack JS SDK, React, Angular, and then various um, chat apps on top. A completely separate one on iOS, written in Objective-C and Swift. And then an Android SDK one, which has historically been Java, but is currently being rewritten in Kotlin. So you have a completely like, standalone, no um, sort of shared code at all, for better or worse, native implementations of the whole thing on the various different platforms. And other clients, well, you've got all sorts of good stuff. Um, you have um, GTK, um, one's written in Rust. You've got Qt, one's written in C++. You've got command line, one's written in Go. You've got a really nice um, Mac OS native one, which is actually built on top of the iOS SDK at that layer. So the guy went and swapped out the two um, slots at the top for um, a proper native Mac OS one. You've got WeChat, even Thunderbird. If you go into the flags, you can turn it on to make it uh, work as a matrix client. Um, so what do you get? Well, you get all sorts of good stuff. You get decentralized conversation history, of course. Everything is group messaging. No one-to-one -one communication here. A one-to-one -one is just a room with two people in it. Um, you get lots of end-to-end -end encryption. And this is where loads of our time has gone over the years, going and taking the um, signal-style um, double ratchet algorithm, which used to be called Axolotl. And what we do is to establish one-to-one -one encrypted links between all the devices in a room. But then we use that channel to exchange a shared um, group ratchet key over the members of the room. So you get much more scalable group conversations, which are fully end-to-end -end encrypted, than you get on the traditional Signal or you know, WhatsApp kind of things. I think our biggest ones have got thousands of devices um, in the room. And we have just switched um, our implementation on the web from in script and targeting ASM.js to everybody's favorite virtual machine, WASM. Um, and that sped things up by a factor of 20. So we should now be good for about 20,000 devices in a room rather than 1,000 devices, at least on the web. Um, other good stuff, we get VoIP signaling for WebRTC. So you can do one-to-one -one and group calls over it. You can get server-side push notification rules, which is a big deal, so that your push notifs are all synchronized over all your clients. Server-side search, read receipts, typing notifications, all the kind of edge casey stuff that makes a difference between a kind of crappy proof of concept and a proper competitor to Discord or Slack, et cetera. So enough talking um, about what you actually get. Let's actually look at how it works. And here's one I prepared earlier somewhere. Um, probably the best way to visualize it is if you've got these three nodes and you've got the clients hanging off them, 
And at the moment, we use DNS to identify these nodes. But in future, we're going to be shifting over to something better than DNS, possibly a DHT. And in fact, we've been talking um, to the libptp guys. I had a great conversation with Mike last night about switching over to libptp as a transport. But for now, we're using DNS and HTTPS in order to link these nodes together. But if Alice wants to go and send a message, um, she goes and does an HTTP post to her server. It starts building up a directed acyclic graph of messages, relays it out to the other servers for Mesh that should be participating in the room. They store it too. And you can see that we're starting to build up this kind of shared um, uh, graph across all the servers. It then gets pushed out, or it gets sucked out, in fact, by calling get on the sync API. And hey, presto, Alice has spoken to Bob and Charlie. Now, the fun stuff happens if Bob responds. And you can see that we literally start to build up a graph here where Bob's message follows Alice's. And then if Charlie responds at the same time, you're in an interesting position because you have an inconsistent view of the world. Now, this is OK in Matrix. This isn't like a blockchain. It's not like we need to seal the block in order to make sure everyone is consistent. As long as, you know, over the next couple of minutes, hours, possibly days, I mean, it might be that Bob goes offline for a week now and comes back, and then he wants to rejoin the conversation. Eventually, it will get consistent. But we don't have any hard um, consistency requirements for a purely real-time, non-financial um, transaction-based system. So what in practice happens here is that Bob's message fans out, and you start to form a temporary fork in the DAG on Charlie's server. And Charlie's message will also fan out, at which point, hey, look, everybody's got the same thing going on again. We're eventually consistent, and we're basically building up this shared data structure. And if anybody is familiar with how Git works under the surface, it's identical. We've really ripped off Git and applied it for real-time communication. So. That's what's going on under the hood. You're probably wondering, why am I here? What the hell has this got to do with Web3? And that would be a quite reasonable question. Obviously, Matrix is a chain, or actually a tree of blocks, as opposed to a blockchain. Um, today, we're not P2P. You can see the servers are decentralized, but the clients are very deliberately thin. And we consider this very much a feature. And a lot of our work goes into making clients and bots and bridges that don't suck. And the federation and the decentralization bit gets a and slightly second priority. In future, we're hoping to change this quite massively, and we're talking like over the next years here, to change the servers to run client side. So you can migrate from username to domain tuples to elliptic curve T4519 public keys. We can then store the data on the client, and we're opening things much more up for metadata protected um, communications. I mean, Jeff's talk earlier was fascinating in terms of the focus that they're putting on protecting metadata, whereas today on Matrix, your server inevitably builds up this big data structure, which has a lot of metadata in it. But if we shift that server client side, suddenly everything is open for doing the same sort of tricks that they're looking at with Hopper. Um, also means that you can still use the servers if you want, um, because in practice, who, who wants to have their only copy of their conversation sitting on the phone? That would be crap. Instead, you want to have a point of presence on the server. Um, looking at using WebRTC data channels for federation, and the end result ends up looking a lot more DAP friendly, frankly. You can imagine that you can swap out the federation there, perhaps for IPFS entirely, and have the entire thing running as a JavaScript DAP in browser. And you know, it's feeling a lot more Web3. So that's the direction that we're going. Alternatively, um, there are also Web3 projects out there, like Raiden from the BrainBot folks, um, who are using Matrix as a transport today, because it's a very pragmatic, decentralized pub sub with end-to-end -end encryption and storage and transport. So very quick, very simple diagram um, to show basically today you have your client, which has encryption and the local cache, which talks HTTP to a server that talks HTTP to another server. In the nearest future, we're working on matrix daemons, um, which will allow you to run, basically split the client in two and run the matrix -y bit of it as a system daemon that everything can connect to. So you can have multiple apps on your computer talking to this thing that acts as a daemon. And it's a bit like a push service. And in fact, you would be able to use matrix as a replacement for GCM or FCM or APNS. Um, another way of doing that would be to embed the daemon in the client, at which point um, it's kind of looking similar to this, but architecturally using a separate API internally. And then in future, this guy can become a full peer-to-peer -peer home server with the home server running locally, either as a separate process or even embedded into the client, at which point we're really looking at a peer-to-peer -peer approach. 
So that's kind of the overall architectural things. I'm going to talk about some of the more specific stuff that we've been up to recently, probably going a bit fast because I'm waffling for a change. Um, first of all, anybody recognize this XKCD? It's from about a year ago now. God, somebody must be religiously reading XKCD other than me. Okay, we've got Kirill, thank you for um, being aware of this XKCD. Um, so this was originally, before I graffitied all over it, um, Randall making a point that I have a hard time keeping track of which contacts use which chat systems, and he drew it. And here we are on Matrix, literally doing a key to say, here are the bridges which are at least in beta, and the red ones are the ones in alpha. And in fact, this needs to be updated, because since then, we've got a WhatsApp bridge um, that is actually actually a wall bridge that some crazy person wrote. Um, there's a Zephyr bridge as well, and I don't think we have any others. But you get the idea. Bridging is done using a node stack. Um, we provide a bunch of libraries, and you can go and put things on top. For instance, an IRC bridge could look like this. This might be Freenode, and you have a bridge that links it into Matrix. So you've got people in a chat room on Freenode talking to people on Matrix, completely unaware that they're talking to people on Matrix. Similarly, you do a similar thing for Slack. This one might be a bit more interesting, that there is a bridge through to Whisper. It's called Matrix Whisper Bridge, um, written by a wonderfully anonymous guy called No Man, or not called No Man, I guess. And um, the architecture here is that you could have um, ultralight clients, um, like status, talking through to Ethereum nodes, and then the bridge connects through to multiple Ethereum node or status peers there in order to bridge the world of Whisper into the world of Matrix. A uh, different type of bridge, which I used to do as a demo until the drone crashed, is to actually control the drone over Matrix. Um, you'd use command line things to launch it and have it fly around the place. And you get the video off the drone, and you could view it as a video call in Matrix. So we're bridging the horrible embedded C API that the drone gives you here and putting it into the general open ecosystem of Matrix. You could do it with VoIP um, using something like FreeSwitch as well. So that's bridging. It's one of the fun things about Matrix. Historically, it's been a bit underinvested, but we do have somebody working full time on them now, or almost full time on them, and um, uh, the future is looking kind of exciting. End to end encryption. I've already basically explained how it works. We're looking into MLS in future, which is an IETF standard for group encryption. But if anybody wants to geek out about nitty gritty um, group end to end encryption, come chat. Other stuff going on include communities, which allow you to define groups of users and rooms, and widgets, which are really cool in that they allow you to embed arbitrary HTML apps, including dApps, into your room. And so you can basically turn any chat room into a dashboard of increasingly exciting um, functionality. So I'm going to switch over at this point to actually show you Riot, um, which has got all sorts of exciting things happening to it. Let me find a room which um, I can actually demo from. So this is right running on web as it stands today. I'm in about uh, well, 500 low priority conversations there. I'm in 1,500 rooms, 130 one-to-one -one conversations. It's a very, very, very um, scalable um, system. If I go into a big room like Matrix HQ, hoping that nothing too disastrous is happening here, people can. Am I not on screen? It's a disaster. Sorry. Thank you. I should have noticed that. I'm going to blame Microsoft and PowerPoint for wrecking my beautiful mirroring. On the plus side, I didn't see all the rooms which I flashed up that I shouldn't have shown you. <laughs> um, so here is Matrix HQ. So uh, one of many, many rooms um, going on here. And uh, it's not a particularly exciting conversation. There's people arguing about abuse and um, moderation in Matrix, which is a whole thing in its own right. You can see I've got all these read receipts bubbling down the right-hand side here. Um, where else can I go? What's happening in the Riot room? Um, new release candidate of Riot going on here. This room's got 600 people in it. Um, you've got presents going on. I can say, hello, world, in here. And assuming I have enough internet connection, which doesn't look great, then it would actually send the message. I'm even tethered, so it should be working all right. And you'll probably see people's read receipts come bubbling down the right-hand side. Why doesn't Slack have read receipts? Can anybody explain to me? Because these are one of the most useful things in the world to see who has read your message. So Mr. Delta has read my message at that timestamp. Makes a massive difference. So that's basically Riot as it sits today. Now, one of the things I wanted to show today as a special sneak preview is that we've been redesigning Riot for ages. And a lot of people might be familiar, well, some people might be familiar with it. I know that Parity and the Web3 Foundation use Riot as uh, their primary communication tool. And um, let me see if I can give you a quick preview of the future. Yeah, here we go. So this 
my friends, is where things are going in future. This is the first time that the redesign of Riot has ever been um, seen um, in public. And in fact, we were just putting it together just before I came on stage. So that's why it's literally a completely initial um, deployment here. And some of the fun things we've done is to make everything resizable um, so that you can actually adjust the left and right panel. This also means that the right panel can have a lot more content in it now, things like files and search results. Um, everything's um, the full page. Um, you've got oh, uh, read markers and day markers, um, um, typing notifications going on there. And most excitingly, you can now resize all of these different panels. Basically, the whole thing is turned into a very tileable, resizable thing, so that if you start embedding content in here, like for instance, I could go into our app store if I have enough connectivity. I wonder if I'm better off on the, is the Wi-Fi working at the moment here? Should I detether? Anybody having joy on the Wi-Fi? It is? OK. Let me see if things speed up if I switch network then. Um, so yeah, I can go and add an integration into here. Oh, yeah, this is nice and fast now. So I could do something like, I know, add an etherpad into the room like that. And then hopefully, up at the top, yeah, you get a little iframe oh, saying, hello, everybody. Hello, and you'd be able to do some live typing collaboration going on. But it could equally well be a video conference, or it could be, um, oh, I've been asked to zoom by Amandine. Let me zoom in a bit, except the zooming isn't aware of our beautiful new resizable UI yet. But is that a bit more legible? People see what's going on? Um, so I could hide this. I could replace it with a different um, thing. You can see GitHub integrations flying around. So yeah, there you go. Sneak preview of things to come. Um, Thank you. I should say thank you to Bruno, by the way, who's the developer who's been frantically over the last couple of days applying lots of CSS to go and bring things in line with the new design. And if we um, actually flip over to Zeppelin, you can see we've got a new dark skin on the horizon looking like that. And there are pages upon pages upon pages. That's uh, what the new member info looks like. Um, Lots and lots of good stuff on the horizon as basically we take Riot from looking like the slightly green and weird thing it is today to something that hopefully can really punch its way against Slack and Discord. So what else can I tell you? Um, community status, things are going pretty well. We've been at this a while now, since 2014, um, but there are about 6 million accounts visible on the network. Um, that's about 3.8 on the matrix.org server, so about 50% are on the kind of default server, 50% are in the wild. Getting 2 million messages a day, um, million unbridged accounts, so it's actually more than that now. Um, about 10,000 nodes on the public network that we're aware of. Um, however, there are lots of dark matrix deployments out there too. Um, and a whole bunch of companies building solutions on top of it. And actually, these uh, message rates are quite old now. I, I think we're up way beyond that. So what's next? First of all, exciting times that um, France, um, the country, um, adopted Matrix as its official communication protocol. It was a bit unintuitive to us that the first people to really get excited about using Matrix, Matrix at scale would be a government. But it turns out the governments like end-to-end -end encryption. They like decentralization because they are intrinsically decentralized across all the different ministries. And so what they've done there is to roll out Matrix clusters over all of the ministries. About half of them are in place now. Built a custom app um, on, the, uh, on Android, which looks a bit like that. Everything is end-to-end. End encrypted, and you've got all sorts of enterprise-y exciting security requirements like antivirus, etc. So really fun project, really exciting, and it wasn't the direction we were expecting Matrix to go, but it's been a great opportunity to make sure that Matrix really is good for prime time. And uh, at the moment, it's um, in trial and has been over the course of the summer, was being audited, and uh, we're expecting it to go properly kaboom in a good way um, at around the same time that we hit a 1.0 towards the end of the year. Already spoken about all new Riot. Um, also got all new Riot on mobile coming through. There are some of the mock ups. It's not a real app yet, sorry. Um, end to end encryption Nirvana. So, our end to end encryption is amazing. We got it audited by NCC Group, paid for by the OTF, and it was all going wonderfully and fantastic. And the code is beautiful. If you want group end to end encryption, use ours. The UX is terrible. And this is a really embarrassing thing, and I apologize profoundly to everybody who's used Riot and wondered why they spend their lives cross-verifying devices and all of the weird glitches the UX. So we've spent the last couple of months in a massive project to completely fix the UX. And the big things are that you incrementally back up your keys if you want onto the server, encrypted, of course. 
Um, totally new verification flows, and also the ability to cross-sign devices, so you don't need to keep on cross-signing people's um, identity. I will very quickly try to um, show you the sort of things we've been doing. So these are the wireframes. It's obviously not the actual graphical assets, but uh, I will just very quickly keep flipping through, showing you all of the new screens which are on the horizon for you know, manually managing your encryption keys, using a passphrase to protect them and incrementally back them up, keeping them safe. Um, now the new trust in devices, um, so you only need to trust somebody once, and it will propagate to all the other devices, and so on, and so on, and so forth. So this is obviously a quick tease to say, we're working on it. It's so nearly there, you can literally see it. Um, and hopefully, that will be going live over the coming months as well as part of the 1.0 um, sprint. So what's left? Big thing is a stable release of the Federation API. Um, which historically, as I said, has been a bit unloved, and we're now putting all of our resources on the server side into fixing this. That means a hard fork of the protocol to um, deploy our final state resolution algorithm, event IDs and hashes, which is a, a misdesign of the old federation protocol, close as many P1s as we can in the reference implementation, finish the right redesign in end-to-end -end UX, and we're done. We can all go home, and having taken over the world, it'll be great. Or alternatively, we can just continue reworking communities, reactions, editable messages, do the Go implementation, threading, peer-to-peer -peer matrix, like I mentioned, and the two big ones, especially decentralized reputation, because we have an existential threat to matrix as people try to do nasty things with it, and the ability to separate the good guys from the bad guys for your personal definition of what is good and bad um, is key to that. And we're going to be doing a lot of work in that. If anybody wants to talk about decentralized reputation, please, please come and talk to me, because this is our single biggest focus after 1.0. And decentralized identity, too. We do need help, if it wasn't obvious. Um, don't use centralized services for your chat. Please stop using Slack. Stop using Telegram. As in, <laughs> thank you. It's not perfect, what we have today, but it's very, very usable on a daily basis. We've been dog fooding it for years. Places like Parity use it day to day as their primary chat system, so you can do it too. There is no excuse to be using Slack for decentralized development. So please run a server. Um, build bridges and bots to your own services. Don't reinvent the wheel. Um, consider at least using the client side of Matrix. Even if you've got a really sexy thing like the Whisper V2 stuff going on, please consider just using Matrix for the client side so you can plug right straight in. And finally, follow us on Twitter and spread the word. And I've got 12 seconds left. Shall I try to do a demo in VR in 12 seconds? It would be amazing. It won't work, but let's try it anyway. Um, so here's an example of something completely different. Everybody is way too used to um, uh, Matrix for chat, but everyone forgets that Matrix is actually you know, any kind of communication. This literally will only take a second or two, hopefully. Um, let me check I've actually got internet connectivity, because that will be the minor flaw here. So here we are in a WebGL holodeck. Um, Star Trek, The Next Generation, Series 2, as I'm sure many people recognized. And if I had connectivity on my phone, then I would be getting a, a voice call um, coming through, or a video call, in fact, coming through to my iPhone 10 here. Come on, you can do it. Let me hit refresh for good luck. Ah, probably help if I put my matrix ID in here so it knew who to call. Okay, so here it comes again. This is built using A-Frame, which is a great little um, web VR um, um, engine. And it's using the Matrix SDK in JS under the hood to go and place this video call through to me from this room. And I have a conversation coming in on my iPhone 10. Oh, I need to give it permission to actually do WebRTC. That's always a good idea. And then hopefully, if we have enough connectivity, and if the demo gods are smiling um, sufficiently, I'll get a call coming in here on my phone. It actually comes in as call kit, as you can see. I go and hit accept here, and hopefully my placeholder video there will disappear and be replaced. Come on, come on, come on, come on, you can do it. By me, in 3D. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> this is... Um, Aaron, can I borrow you to, yeah, sorry, do if it. you Let's can do uh, demo uh, me. If, um, this is very hard to point a camera at your face and use a computer at the same time. If you use the cursor keys to slightly, well, in fact, can you model for me? 
Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Here we are. Yeah. So Look here this. is a 3D Aeron, and as I move around, you can see, okay, it's not perfect. We're a little bit, help me, Obi-Wan, I'm your man, your hope. Put your hand in front of it, perhaps. Um, yeah, so you can really see that there's like the depth coming through from the hand. And if you look at it from the right direction, it kind of makes sense. Okay, let's, <laughs> let's take the hand away. And, um, and one of the fun things you can do is if you look roughly straight on, it's, oh, you're a bit um, bleached out, but the idea is still there. Um, you can imagine that um, you look a bit lost in the matrix, man. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, what, what's going on is um, that we're, what we could do is to like rotate the field of view here slightly so that we actually make eye contact. And I don't know if you've ever noticed in a video call, you often have a massive emotional problem that the person's looking at the camera, except uh, no, they're not looking at the camera. They're looking at the screen. They're looking at your face on the screen. They're not looking at the camera. And as a result, everybody's looking really shifty and looking at the wrong thing, and it just feels a bit weird. Whereas with this, um, admittedly, I can't quite hype myself up to Aaron's level, so to speak, but I could potentially <laughs> go and rotate his face in 3D so that I do have eye contact with him. So it's a bit more of a practical reason why this is a good idea and why it's not very useful to do that unless people stick out their tongue and sort of silliness like that. Anyway, you get the idea that this is um, one of the world's first ever 3D video calls. I don't know why anyone else isn't doing this, because I think it's pretty cool. I mean, you've got a video, uh, you've got the 3D camera from the dot projector, you've got the video camera too, and and um, we just do two streams, one for the depth buffer and one for the image. You can see they can get a bit out of sync, which looks wonderfully trippy. Um, but either way, it's an example of something completely different ne negotiated over Matrix, which isn't chat. Thank you very much. Matthew, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, now, we're kind of running into um, the break slightly, so... Uh, what Matthew's agreed to do is to go to the MAA, um, oh, ask me anything corner, AMA corner. So if you have any uh, questions or discussions um, now, then please follow Matthew out to the AMA corner. Thank you again. Thanks, Cheers.